participants are in a listen-only mode into the question and answer session of the conference. During that time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 and clearly record your name for question introduction. I would now like to turn the call over to your host, Ms. Joyce Rose. You may begin. Thank you. Thank you, and welcome to the Child Welfare Information Technology Systems Managers and Staff Webinar Series brought to you on behalf of the Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families, Children's Bureau, and presented by ICF International. Today's webinar is entitled New Jersey's Managed by Data Fellows Program, and I am Joyce Rose, your host and moderator for today's webinar. Next slide, please. For New attendees, and for those who may have missed previous webinars, here's the list of the previously recorded uh, sessions which are posted to the link identified on the slide. Please note that in August we are planning to present a webinar focusing upon processes to better estimate IT project costs, and we are currently working on identifying future webinar topics. Next, please. Attendees are encouraged to participate in our webinar with questions and comments. All of the participant lines are muted now, but we will open them for the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. However, please be aware that you can submit questions at any time using the GoToWebinar chat feature, and those will be addressed during the Q&A session. Now, should we run out of time, we will respond to your questions via email and or should you have additional questions, you may submit those to me at the email address listed on the slide, Joyce at KSS.com. Also, if you have any topics that you would like to recommend as potential webinars, please do not hesitate to contact me at the email listed above. Next. The Division of State Systems within the Children's Bureau continues to provide a series of monthly webinars supporting information sharing and discussion. Understanding who is attending the webinars helps to identify content that is applicable for everyone participating in your agency's CWIS efforts. Please self-select one of the five categories listed, and my colleague Christy will conduct the poll. Christy? And at this time, you should be seeing that question on your screen, so go ahead and select. And we have about 80% at this point, so we'll wait for the remaining. And we'll go ahead and close. Um, so we have about 12% of you saying that you're state um, project managers, 73% state program policy or technical, um, no tribal, um, and 15% ACS. Thank you, Christy. And I'm very pleased to see um, the large percentage coming from um, across disciplines in, in the agencies. So let's move on now and let's actually meet our participants or our presenters. Uh, Amanda O'Reilly is the Director of the Office of Research, Evaluation, and Reporting for DCF. She is responsible for the oversight and implementation of the Department's Outcomes Analysis, Program Evaluations, and Federal Child Welfare Reporting. Ms. O'Reilly also provides leadership and technical assistance around the Department's continuous quality improvement and capacity building efforts. She is experienced in public health, child welfare, and health services research through her work as a research scientist with Policy Lab at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Abby DeMio is coordinator for the New Jersey Department of Children and Families Managed by Data Fellows Program. Abby oversees and manages the Data Fellows Program, and her work includes quantitative and qualitative analysis, curriculum development and delivery, leveraging the work of the fellows alumni towards current DCF goals and priorities, and ensuring that the alumni remain engaged in their project work and continue to utilize the skills they learned. Unfortunately, Aubrey Powers was called away, and um, he will not be uh, part of the presentation or presenter staff today. 
So now um, let's get to the presentation, and um, I'd like to turn it over to Abby. Abby? Thank you, Joyce, and thank you to the team at the Children's Bureau for the opportunity to present today. Um, so I want to just review the objectives for the webinar. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about um, our challenge here in New Jersey um, back about six years ago in building capacity to utilize data to improve outcomes for children and families. We're going to talk a little bit about um, our methods of teaching, uh, talk about quality improvement projects initiated by the data fellows, and identify some of our successes, some of our lessons learned, and talk a little bit about sustainability as well. Um, so our primary function here is to support the department's continuous quality improvement efforts. So we, uh, with the participants, we want to develop their leadership skills and really create, communicate, and anchor a vision of creating a data culture in every level of the department, not just uh, where we sit in central office in research evaluation and reporting. Um, we want to influence and motivate our participants uh, to have them use their skills to motivate others uh, and really become champions of data and to really uh, ultimately sustain the agency as data-driven. Next. Uh, so a little bit of background about our agency. Um, we want to make sure that everybody understands kind of what the structure is. Uh, we want to talk about the why and how of fellows. Um, and talk a little bit about the history. So we have had to adapt the program model. Um, we are about to enter our fifth cohort of fellows. Um, so things in round five look a lot different than they did in round one. So we'll talk a little bit about the tracking and adjusting that we've done over the years. Next. So uh, the Department of Children and of Families is a cabinet level agency here in New Jersey and our mission is to ensure the safety, well-being, and success of New Jersey's children, women, and families. So some of our priorities right now include reducing incidents of child abuse and neglect, ensuring permanency for children who enter out-of-home care, continuing the integration of a system of care for children with behavioral, intellectual, and developmental disabilities as well as co-occurring disorders and supporting programs and services for women and adolescents uh, in the transition to adulthood, as well as managing outcomes by data. So Child Protection and Permanency is our Child Protective Service um, unit and our largest operating unit. Almost 90% of the department's staff sit in Child Protection and Permanency with about 6,500 employees. Um, so CPMP, as I, you'll hear me refer to it, we love our acronyms here. Um, CPMP meets federal requirements for New Jersey's Child Protection and Child Welfare Agency. Our children's system of care is an integrated system of care, um, and again, it serves children and youth with developmental disabilities, emotional and behavioral challenges, as well as substance abuse disorders, and supports their families as well. Uh, the um, Office of uh, Family and Community Partnerships is our prevention arm, um, and they support a number of programs through a statewide uh, network of community programs, including family success centers, our home visiting initiatives, as well as school-based services with the aim of preventing child abuse and neglect. Our Office of Performance Management and Accountability is where um, my office, or Amanda's office, our office sits the uh, research evaluation and reporting. Uh, under performance management and accountability, we also have our Office of Quality, um, and we also have uh, a specialized unit that focuses on um, kind of the most, uh, the worst outcomes, our child fatalities, our domestic violence fatalities, and reviews uh, cases where there may be unusual uh, circumstances or incidents. Um, we also have a division on women, which advances discussion of critical women's issues. Uh, as well as an Office of Adolescent Services, which coordinates service delivery for youth aging out of the system and transitioning to adulthood. So that is an overview of our department. Next, please. So um, we are a state-administered child welfare system. New Jersey, if you're not familiar with it, is made up of 21 counties. And we have 46 field level offices in those 21 counties, and those offices are overseen by nine area offices. We do have a centralized abuse and neglect hotline, our centralized, uh, state centralized res registry. Uh, in the first half of 2015, the hotline averaged about 13,000 calls a month. Uh, about 6,000 were uh, child protective service investigations and child welfare assistance assessments. Um, 
and that's, again, in the first uh, two quarters of the year. And as of June 30, 2015, uh, we had over 50,000 children under our supervision, with 7,500 of those being uh, in placement and out-of-home placement. Next, please. So uh, to, to bring you back a little bit, um, our reform in New Jersey began in 2006. Uh, the department, the cabinet level department was created and New Jersey entered a modified settlement agreement um, which required obviously data production for outcomes. Uh, we started by implementing a case practice model and focused on engaging our children, youth, and families. Uh, we reduced caseloads, we increased training, uh, we require, still require staff to take 40 hours annually of training. Um, we also recognize that managing by data is important to track progress and also to increase accountability. Uh, so we have invested substantial resources to increase the capacity of our case management data system. Um, much of our data that we use is real time and it's accessible at every level of the agency. Uh, it's important to note that here in New Jersey, our Office of Information Technology is actually separate from our Office of Research, Evaluation, and Reporting, and that's relatively recent. Um, the two offices began as one and split in 2012, but we have a very close working relationship with OIT. Um, so our statewide, uh, excuse me, our statewide child uh, welfare system uh, New Jersey Spirit, we had release one in 2004, and we rolled out a full release in August of 2007. So at this point, our, this, uh, our SACWIS system is well stabilized, and there is direct worker input to um, our SACWIS system. Our uh, safe measures is our, as very close to real-time data reporting, uh, and it uses the case management data to display actionable items for use by frontline child welfare workers, their supervisors, as well as folks here in central office. Uh, we are, uh, transparency is something that's very important to leadership here at DCF. So we have um, public reports that are published on our uh, website, um, on the state uh, website, as well as we have internal reports that are published on our intranet. Um, and those reports include point in time data, longitudinal data, um, on a number of different uh, divisions and offices within DCF. Uh, research evaluation and reporting is also responsible for ad hoc reports for staff, so they, we do um, requests as uh, staff needs to analyze, um, you know, something in their area. We also will produce ad hoc reports. We, uh, our local offices for child protection and permanency participate in child stat, which helps assess case practice model implementation, um, provides a in-depth case review of one case by one office, um, and there's a number of different staff that participate um, so we can um, really build up the quality improvement processes on a broad level with the hope that uh, folks there will bring it back to their local office. Uh, we do targeted reviews of investigation quality and adolescent services, and we have regular calls with our local offices here at RER and in the Office of Quality um, on our key performance indicators for our various uh, federal measures. Next, please. So um, we produce a number of different types of data here, uh, and there is obviously different data for different users and uh, uses. So um, this is one of the first things that we teach the fellows is uh, about the different kinds of data and what each one means. So our point in time data is simple, timely, it's easy to understand, it's easy to produce. Our key performance measure indicators provides uh, the staff in the field uh, process measures that are familiar to them and relevant to their direct service. Our outcome data is our big picture measure of our system performance. And we also have our qualitative data uh, through our qualitative reviews and our targeted reviews um, that's more exploratory, that's descriptive. Um, and I provided some examples of some of our uh, data for each of these uh, types. Next, please. Uh, 
So we thought it was important for you um, because we know different di different states have uh, and tribes have different ways of, of um, using their case management data. So this is a screenshot of our system, Safe Measures. Um, our MSA, our Modified Settlement Agreement, has 55 indicators with over 200 measures. So Safe Measures, our case management system, um, includes 100 different measures to assist field staff with managing their work. Um, and it's separated into different categories like case practice fundamentals, permanency case management, and tabs for investigations and assessments. So when a supervisor is going into their measure, and for this particular measure, it's their contact with uh, children, um, in New Jersey, monthly contact is our minimum requirement. So supervisors usually will use this screen to click on the small pink bar um, in contact not recorded and then look at those 95 cases that were not seen that month. Um, so this data is ne near real time. It's extracted overnight. So some staff check in daily, some staff check in weekly. Um, but for most staff, this is where it ends. It's really a compliance tool to see what has not been done. They don't necessarily focus on the, um, the trend over time, and they don't necessarily look at how other offices or units uh, compare to them or um, compare to other places in the state. Next, please. So in 2009, um, you know, a few years after our reform started, we had a lot of data, and we found that staff, um, both some in leadership roles as well as our frontline workers and supervisors, tended to be uncomfortable using data and uncomfortable talking about data and just weren't data savvy. Um, so while our technology grew, um, our staff's analytic skills did not grow at the same rate as the technology. So our challenge was how to get staff outside of IT and outside of reporting and outside of executive leadership to really understand data and to actually value it. So we wanted all levels of staff um, at all, you know, throughout the agency to be able to transition between the numbers and good practice um, because we know at this level that numbers um, can lead to good practice and we want to build that capacity as an agency to become data-driven and self-correcting. Next, please. Um, so to bring you to the beginning of fellows, in 2009 and 2010, much of the work to create the Data Fellows Program started. Uh, the department applied for and received a grant from the Northeast and Caribbean Child Welfare Implementation Center. Uh, there was a call for applications in fall of 2010, and in January 2011, the first round began. Uh, so we really sought to transform DCF into an organization where data is used routinely to inform practice and performance, as well as identify, diagnose, and address issues. Um, so DCF and NCIC conducted interviews with other states that were identified by the Children's Bureau to uh, examine what some promising practices in relation to managing by data and other quality improvement. So uh, there was a literature review conducted of best practice, there were interviews conducted, and from that um, DCF uh, contracted with an outside agency to develop the Managing by Data Fellows Program. Next, please. So um, something that Data Fellows does and something that emerged from the work that was done uh, to create the program was that we, we thought it would be successful if we could target mid-level staff. Um, so we think that's relatively unique. We target middle managers, so the frontline supervisors, our area quality coordinators, and support staff um, at a level of some decision making in other divisions and offices. Uh, so central office staff uses data-driven management, um, but field and direct service staff were less comfortable and in some cases even distrustful of data. Uh, so the applications went out and about 150 staff applied for, five, uh, for 100 um, spots in the program. So each, um, the strategy was to seed offices with staff with these skills, so they were uh, grouped geographically into five groups th throughout our state, each with their own de dedicated facilitator to deliver the class materials, to teach the concepts, to provide hands-on coaching, and to really guide their work over the 18 months of the program. 
Next, please. So our objectives in Data Fellows, and this is something that has not changed since uh, the inception of the program, we are grounded in good case practice principles. We want to develop the presentation skills of our participants. We want to help them understand and demystify data. Uh, we want them to be data experts and master qualitative and quantitative tools be able to recognize challenging while also celebrating good practice and supporting positive change, act as a local resource while they're in the program as well as when they graduate, and really grow the workforce. And this is a sustainability plan for our workforce to create a promotable workforce that has data management skills and understands how to use data for good outcomes. So we partnered with two external groups, a New Jersey-based firm and a nonprofit in Alabama, to develop and deliver the curriculum. Both had extensive child welfare knowledge and experience with our department, and they were very excited to partner with our leadership on the initiative. So an 18-month curriculum was created, which included project work, analyzing live administrative da data, conducting qualitative case reviews, and finally they developed options for solutions for executive leadership. So the program teaches analysis in a way that uses both the quantitative and qualitative uh, data. Um, on the ground, at the front line level, and throughout the organization as opposed to just in central office with executive staff or, or uh, central office staff. The program also focuses on developing the fellow skills in leadership, presentation, team building, and part of the program is that there are two large presentations, an interim and a final, uh, with an audience that includes executive staff, external stakeholders, their colleagues in their offices. Um, and, you know, our last couple of, of presentations have had 200, 250 participants. So these are large presentations that are not something that most participants would have an opportunity to, uh, to experience. Next, please. So this uh, learning and improvement cycle, I just wanted to compare and contrast it with um, what's going to be my next slide. So this is uh, the approach that we use in fellows. We begin with the diagnostics, and we spend a lot of time on diagnostics. Uh, we begin by identifying some of their assumptions and using those assumptions to form hypotheses. And we tell the fellows from day one, um, you know, some of your assumptions may be correct, uh, but we need to do the diagnostics and look at the data in order to prove it or disprove it. And chances are, if we have to disprove it, um, there will be other folks at the office doing the work um, that you'll need to convince as well. And that's where building their data skills uh, really, really will help them throughout um, the program and, and after. Um, so they do investigation of both the quantitative and qualitative data. They conduct a literature review. Um, they analyze their data and discard the myths. Um, and this really is a cycle because they may, you know, be working on something and realize they have to then track and adjust and do a little bit more analysis before really getting to the planning and implementation um, part of the cycle. Um, so the next slide is the, um, the framework for um, effective practice in child welfare in order to design, test, and spread. And even though the language is different, there's a lot of similar concepts used. So um, as we as an agency begin to embrace, um, you know, this, this framework, uh, the work that the fellows has been doing really, really connects um, with a lot of these concepts um, that we develop and test, we compare and learn, and when we find things that are working and we, we see good outcomes and we learn about the business process of what's happening to get to those good outcomes, that's when we try to replicate and adapt it in other places. Um, and as a program, we are beginning to talk more about um, really being able to um, evaluate and how to uh, successfully evaluate some of the things that the fellows have implemented, which um, have been really driven by the fellows themselves. Um, so one of the um, – next slide, please. Um, so with our external consultant, we have um, currently now the fellows program is completely in-house. So we have transitioned from being um, a, it was a contracted program uh, delivered and administered primarily or uh, totally by out an outside 
consultant to now having the program completely in-house. So that was a transition over five years coming. Um, so in round one, back in 2011, there were 18 seminars over 18 months. Um, the first round was successful. Uh, the fellows explored topics like investigation quality, delayed permanency, uh, frequently encountered families, and ex they explored resource care. Uh, fellows found, um, fellows examined data and practices and found that offices that took the time to hold investigative supervisory conferences more often tended to have high quality and timely investigations. So they looked for things that matter to their staff as well as to um, our leadership and our stakeholders here and uh, try to replicate that. So in the first six seminars were structured, um, it's all about data. We expose them to external data, internal data, that um, a worker or a supervisor on the frontline level may not have a lot of exposure to. Um, the middle portion of, of, of the uh, curriculum is focused on utilizing data to manage change. We talk a lot about business process and data flow. Uh, we focus on um, safety, permanency, and well-being around our case practice. And then the final seminars focus on improving outcomes. So we pull back the lens a little bit and look at data, all of the data that they've done over their project work in a really systemic con context um, and using all of the analysis to make informed decisions about uh, potential solutions or implementation at a local level. Uh, so leadership across the department was very encouraged by the results um, of the first round and decided to invest in a second round. Um, that first round was, uh, there was an evaluation done by um, an external evaluator, so there were some recommendations made as a result. Um, and the time of having, you know, your valuable staff out of the office um, for 18 months was a common refrain. So in round two, um, the seminars were condensed from 18 months to nine months. Now, it wasn't less information, um, but the 18 seminars were now condensed into two a month. Um, and the, uh, the, ha the participants get the same content, uh, the same expectations, uh, they just get less time to do it. Um, so we think about sustainability of the program and promoting fellows' leadership skills. Um, so we began using fellows' alumni as coaches. So the graduates of the program agreed to come back and their leadership agreed for them to come back to work um, with the next round hands-on with coaching, with feedback uh, to support the facilitation team who was doing mo most of the analysis and delivery of the materials. Next slide, please. So um, these nine rectangles are the um, themes of the nine seminars that we have. And this is what the program looks like today. So it is the same curriculum, just condensed. Um, and we, as you can see going through it, we begin with just building their basic Excel skills, um, building charting skills, introducing them to PowerPoint, um, and walk them through to a much more sophisticated level of um, both technical and uh, practical knowledge. So the uh, way that the structure of the program works is we aim for about 40 participants. It really seems to be the sweet spot for uh, the project work that they do, as well as classroom management. The, each round starts in September and ends in June, and we split the group of 40 into two groups of about 20 each, and each group has one assigned alumnus uh, to act as their uh, facilitator to, again, provide that hands-on coaching and support. Um, so the time commitment is still significant. There are generally three fellows days a month, but as it gets closer to presentation time, it's bumped up to four to ensure that all participants are ready. It's, we have um, every year raised the bar for expectations, and we find that the extra planning around those time really does pay off. So um, some of the research that we've done shows that after three months, adults retain about 10% of what they learn in lecture training, uh, lecture-based training. Uh, when they learn by doing, about 65% of the learning is retained. And when they practice what they've learned in the workplace for a number of weeks, 100% of the learning is, can be expected to be retained. So we use um, that study um, 
to inform the curriculum, and uh, because of that, we have uh, developed, it's a, the first day of the month is a full-day seminar um, where they are taught the concepts. It's very interactive, um, but it is a more uh, traditional classroom setting. Uh, the second day, which is usually two days later, is a coaching day, which is um, also interactive, but it usually takes place in a computer lab. So the participants are in Excel. They are in uh, the various reports produced by research evaluation and reporting, and uh, they are manipulating the data. They are um, making their own discoveries. They are given a worksheet to guide their work, um, but the, they are given a number of different activities during class aside from just... Um, you know, the, the computer work, there are multimedia presentations, they're expected to produce charts, um, there are simulations, um, and then we expect them and we challenge them and we kind of force them to tell us um, what they're doing to bring their work back to their office or unit. So we begin the first class by asking what they did um, to impact their office and we elicit a few responses from people so we can um, learn about the things that they're taking back. Um, they, we have them practice public speaking. We have them create elevator pitches. We have them practice for the presentations to leadership. And that's where they really hone those skills and um, become data champions. Uh, so we protect time for assignments. That was another change that was made as the program evolved um, because the two days we found was not enough to get really all of the learning done. And once people are back at the office doing their daily work, it becomes difficult to uh, manage the fellows' assignments, which are fairly intense, um, with their day-to-day -day work and decision-making. So we protected a day for assignments, which the facilitation team also takes part in, um, in order to ensure that they are grasping the concepts. And when we find fellows that have, are really uh, ahead of some of their colleagues, we enlist them to help others. Um, so we... Uh, begin each round of the fellows program with a charge from leadership. They are assigned a topic, and then they spend the nine months completing um, like a quasi-research project. It's not strict by research methods, um, but we do go through, um, as I said, a literature review. Uh, they do data analysis. They do a qualitative case review, um, and we ask them to focus deeply on an area of practice that could benefit from an in-depth analysis. Um, so they're so used to time being just this constant pressure that um, they are just used to making decisions quickly and having people roll with it. So we give them the opportunity to take a step back, to learn, um, to understand more sophisticated uh, quantitative and qualitative skills, to read research, to explore best practices, and to really integrate their experience when working with their colleagues and their staff um, in the program in the office, as well as in our alumni network of fellows graduates. Next, please. So, um, as I mentioned, the administrative structure of the program has shifted, and each year we do more to work towards, or we did more to work towards internal sustainability and capacity building. Um, so critical to the sustainability and success of the program is the support of leadership throughout the department. Uh, our commissioner is a champion of the fellows, um, and much of our executive staff are excited and encourage their staff to participate. Uh, we, have the, we have a professional center, which is our centralized training facility um, that houses our the, uh, mandatory 40 hours of training, as well as um, different events within the department, as well as in some of our sister departments and community agencies. And the professional center allows us to utilize space in their classrooms and in their computer labs um, for the nine months. Um, this is a huge time commitment for the fellows, um, as well as for their offices, so really their managers and their direct supervisors have to be on board as well. Uh, but we found, and as people have more staff participate, that the investment does pay dividends uh, during the program as well as after graduation. So as the coordinator, I am responsible for the daily administration, curriculum updates, seminar delivery, oversight of coaching days. Uh, with um, Amanda and the team here in research evaluation and reporting, um, they help with data analysis, and we... Uh, I like to tell the fellows that, that I'm about, you know, 
five minutes ahead of them. So we start the data analysis before they do, um, but we don't know where the data is going to leave that, lead them. And because they're dealing with live data, um, they may take a different um, turn with their projects than we anticipated or expected. But um, it's, it's not a bad turn. It's, uh, that's actually what we like to see them doing. So the program is a two-facilitator model. There's two people that deliver the materials and um, work with the teams as a whole. So there is this group of um, alumni that uh, is our facilitation team. They have full-time full roles outside of the Data Fellows program, but they volunteer and they have their um, managers and directors' uh, approval to come back to work with the teams. Um, for the entirety of the program. So uh, we have seven uh, facilitators usually that work with the teams, um, and they bring a diversity of knowledge in both their experience and roles, um, and they are, come from all different rounds of the fellows program. Um, some have been involved every year since fellows inception, and some are recent graduates. Um, they are expected to be out of the office um, the same days that the fellows are, as well as um, an additional planning day where we uh, do a uh, kind of a teach back, a practice teach of the material. They are responsible for delivering the seminars. I will jump in as needed, but it, this is really, we try to make them the face of the program. Um, it can be a strain on operations, but they develop additional valuable skills in working with teams um, and developing relationships from staff throughout the department, honing their skills, and um, really um, having their management skills be brought to the next level, um, which benefits their local um, or assigned office. So um, the original staffing, again, was this outside consultant, and there was an internal advisory group. We have maintained the internal advisory group, and we have the full-time coordinator, and um, you know, some years six, sometimes um, eight part-time facilitators or facilitators in training. Next slide, please. This is just a snapshot of our retention rate as of June 2015. Um, and you can see in each round there is a some attrition through the course of the program. Um, when the application uh, process, it, when the application is announced, um, during the application process par participants get a copy of the schedule. Um, they do sign a commitment letter certifying that they'll remain employed by the department for two years after graduating. Um, and during the first few seminars, I am explicit about the expectations. They need to be there for each session for their benefit and for their colleagues. Um, because the nature of the material and the nature of the inter interactive nature of the class and coaching, uh, if they miss more than one day of the program, they cannot complete the program. So this really is a, an intensive commitment. Um, and the people, you see the, you know, 95% and 97% re retention rate. Some of those are um, retirements and some of those are folks who, who have left the agency. Um, we've done a great job in retaining these staff and, um, and really promoting their skills. Uh, next slide, please. So um, just a glance at the median experience of participants is 13 years with the department. We've had some folks who have as few as three years, and um, we have participants, we've had several with uh, 25, 30 plus years with the department. So if you think about, um, and those have been folks who have been in the most recent rounds, I think which is a testament to the program um, and what people are seeing when people graduate and go back to the office, that people who have been here 30 years sign up um, for a nine-month uh, program and commit to two years after graduation. Um, so the largest group of roles um, are, are people in the local offices, the frontline supervisors, their supervisors, um, case practice specialists. So these are the roles that are critical to day-to-day -day decision making that drives the work and drives our outcomes. So these are the staff that need to be making data-informed decisions to improve practice with children, women, and families. Next slide, please. So our goal has always been um, to have fellows throughout the department. Um, and on the left, the pie shows our uh, current alumni distribution uh, with 72% of our staff at that local field direct service level. Um, and 
uh, 28% in other divisions and offices of the department. Um, more than do, 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 half of the alumni, um, so when we talk about promotability and skills, uh, more than half of fellows alumni have either have been promoted either during the program or after graduation, and there are many more that shifted roles or assumed different responsibilities in their offices because of the skills that they've gained during the program. Um, there are a number of offices within the department that now when they are looking um, and, and creating positions will include that they prefer fellows' experience because they've seen the payoff um, that these people can bring to their offices. Next slide, please. So um, in order to shift to this data-driven culture, um, we look at the fellows when they begin, and we try to gauge where they are with um, you know, accepting data as, as a part of their daily work. Um, so when we did the survey in the first round, um, we heard things like data is part of a numbers game. It's done to make the managers and upper-level staff look good. And really, when they see other places doing well in certain measures, they feel like they're manipulating data and they're doing things differently to just look like they're practicing well instead of actually practicing well. So we really wanted to shift from this mistrust of data to having people see how it can benefit them and benefit the children and families we work with. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is an overview of the project topics from round one through round four. Um, so something you'll notice in round one, the, there's five different topics that, while they relate to each other, um, they're five completely separate topics. We narrowed that down a little bit in round two. And in the most recent rounds, and what we found to be really successful is creating an umbrella topic. So in round three, we looked at the statewide placement increase. We saw that our placement numbers were creeping up and were higher than they had been at the past. Um, and out of that came a few subtopics that groups got to focus on. With the uh, fellows in round one, while there were really good results and there was really good information found, we found that people were kind of stretched in. And the umbrella topic allows um, enough flexibility within to focus on different things that matter to different places. So in the most recent round, we looked at stability, and we looked at it through the framework of uh, short stays in care and reentries into care, at placement stability, as well as educational stability, and it was really manageable for our groups. Um, and each group got to look at a topic, um, because some groups do very well with reentry into care, and some do not. Um, so we're not really pigeonholed into one specific topic. Next slide, please. So we use a number of different uh, data sources, and because participants come from a range of experience, a range of offices across the department, uh, their technical skills do vary. Um, so we do our very best to bring everybody to some sort of baseline level. Um, there are people in class who have never opened Excel. There are people who have never used Excel for more than making a table. Um, we teach them how to use functions. Um, we teach them how to create charts. And we teach them how to use PowerPoint and present a um, clean, professional-looking PowerPoint without animations and pop-ups and, um, you know, things that you would want to present to leadership versus things that, you know, are just fun. Um, so we teach them both those technical and practical skills to become better consumers of data and ingrain the data-driven management into, into their day-to-day -day jobs. Uh, so the first two coaching sessions um, of the program are devoted to the technical data, and we use the census data as well as larger DCF reports um, to help them learn how to use Excel. Um, Depending on the area of the department, because there are some that do not work in our child welfare arm, um, some have never opened our case management system safe measures, so we have to teach them how to use that. Um, and fellows in local offices, so a fellow who sits in our state capital in Trenton may not consider what's happening in an office up north, um, may not consider what's happening with practice in Atlantic City. Um, so we do try to open their minds to pick up your head, look around at what's, what's happening around you, and that includes other states and other countries. So that's where we bring in literature reviews, we bring in white papers, briefs, journals, um, ex to expose them to other states' data, other counties' data, 
Um, and then here in RER, we develop a cohort of children specific to their topic. Um, to, and we present that to them to allow them to understand what folks here in RER have to do um, because they get to experience data cleanup firsthand and they realize that when they see a report that there's a lot more that goes into it than just getting a, a clean and polished report, that there actually is a lot of work that's done to clean it up and make it a usable product. Next slide, please. Um, so I want to provide you a couple of quick examples from the fellows' first seminar this year. Again, um, we challenge them to think about things in ways that they have not in the past, um, how they and their office may look different from other places, and how practice differ differs in other places, how resources differ in other places. And as we progress through the seminars, um, they begin to learn more sophisticated analysis of the data and transition just from consumer to storyteller and using all of the data that they've looked at um, to, to, to really tell a story and to um, advocate for something in their local office. Um, so here we like to show the counties, and these are a few counties in the southern part of our state, really how different population change can look, and we challenge them to think about the impact that that has on their day-to-day -day work. Next slide. Um, so we, again, define the different types of data. We talk about point-in-time data, longitudinal data, and we display things in volume and rate to challenge them to think about things in different ways. We look at patterns. We challenge them to look at trend lines, um, and we have them ask questions about the, the information we present. Um, so we spend a lot of time in the beginning of the program challenging their assumptions about data um, and teaching them to check their assumptions because they will need to do that as uh, champions back in their local offices um, or the divisions that they work in. Um, so we really talk a lot about challenging the status quo because that is how we will make change and sustain progress. Um, so for these uh, particular slides, we would actually have a fellow walk us through, and it may seem very tedious, but we start with the title. They tell us where the source was. They tell the story of, you know, we started with our highest ever almost 8,000 children in 2010, and most recently, um, we, while we went down, we are now, um, when this chart was created in August of 2014, we are right where we were in 2010. So um, we challenge them to think about what impact that might have on practice and what some of the assumptions about that may be. Next slide, please. So uh, a lot of the lexicon of fellows has caught on throughout the department through our um, final presentations and through the fellows bringing um, their knowledge and their learning back to their offices. So um, thanks to them, uh, the phrase bright spots or bright spots analysis has caught on throughout DCF. Uh, we succeeded in infusing this language throughout the department, um, and it's a process that we introduced to the fellows very early on. Um, we use a book called Switch, um, which is in uh, at the end of the presentation. It's on the references and resources page, and it talks all about um, how to do to uh, harness small scale changes to produce big outcomes, um, and gives a lot of good real life examples about um, ways that other people have figured things out that have had big impact. Um, so fellows learn that the Bright Sparks analysis starts with identifying the goal and identify where people are meeting the goal. So it's not just identifying great practice, it's actually a set of steps um, about understanding, diagnosing, um, and once I identify and analyze the data, we want them to study the practice, to map out the business process, and to clone the practice um, as it relates to their work in uh, whatever office they sit in. Um, so what works for them is that we tell them people like you have figured this out. They've struggled in the same area. They've figured it out. Um, so it's not about finding solutions and investing a lot of money or creating sweeping policies um, about the new way that we should be doing things. Um, we challenge them to think about how do we make it easier for people, whether it's our workers, our staff, or our families, to do the right thing. Um, next slide, please. So uh, I wanted to present a couple of real-life case studies uh, of our fellows. Um, so length of stay is something that um, – 
I'm sorry. So in the first round of fellows, uh, one of the groups uh, studied investigation uh, timeliness. So it, here in New Jersey, uh, we our policy has investigators complete investigations in 60 days. Um, so we start that conversation by telling the fellows that there are other states that have shorter time frames, there are other states that have longer time frames, and there are some states that don't specify a time frame for uh, investigation time. Um, so we have them look at the statewide data, and they look at patterns across the state, um, patterns within their county, because some counties have four or six local offices. Um, so we challenge them to look at how things look different in other places or what places look similar to them. So the transparency is really effective. Um, and we challenge them to remember and think about if central office is only looking at the aggregate of their county, um, especially for this particular uh, for this particular example, um, you can see that the South office was the Hudson South office was um, performing at a um, much higher rate than the Hudson North office over time. Next slide, please. So the fellows. Um, next step after doing a lot of the data analysis was to talk to their staff and do some interviews. Um, and they had some round tables, and they had a few themes emerge from these conversations about why um, investigation timeliness did not look so good in this, in, uh, this particular office. Um, so people thought the workload was too high, that there were just too many investigations and not enough staff, that people, the office um, that was struggling with timeliness was completing more thorough investigations. Um, that in doing more thorough investigations that they were reducing placements. Um, and then some people thought that some supervisors were doing a better job um, conferencing in order to um, help timeliness along. Um, so their first piece of analysis was looking at the number of intake staff, and they found that both offices actually had the same number of intake staff. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so then they looked at referral volume in the first three months of the year, and they found that the South office actually had more, and they, they remember that's the office that was performing better, had more investigations and therefore um, a higher rate of referrals per staff person than the office that was struggling. Um, and our investigation caseload standard is eight cases per month. So both offices are, in fact, under the investigation uh, standard. Next slide, please. So we teach fellows about leverage metrics. And when they looked at um, the worker and supervisory conferencing, they found that the um, south office was conferencing much more frequently than the north office was. Um, and again, you'd see that uh, similar um, over in the percent of cases completed within 60 days that south was doing much better than north. Um, so they really, as a result of this analysis, um, which sounds very simple, but if you think about staff making decisions on a local level, they do not have the time and some of them don't have the skills um, or haven't been taught the skills to, to do this kind of analysis. So they created a project where they were focusing on supervisory conferencing. Um, and today, so this is now four years later after the fellows have done their project, um, the North office is at 72% uh, supervisory conferencing, the South is at 78%, um, and their investigation quality, both or investigation timeliness, both offices are above 90%. So both are performing much better than they were um, four years ago. And yes, a lot has changed, but the fellows really pushed the idea of conferencing for quality and for timeliness. Uh, next slide, please. So after the final presentations, um, the fellows, there we have poster sessions where the fellows create interactive rooms to present their data as well as their solutions. So this was a project done by, um, really, really spearheaded by one fellow um, who is in not in a leadership role in her local office. Uh, she deals primarily with external stakeholders. So you'll see this service cluster down in Patterson, which is the southern part of the county, um, which receives the most referrals and is the busiest town in Passaic County. Um, but there are a number of referrals that come from where the star is in the northern communities, and the second highest volume of referrals is this town, West Milford. Um, so this fellow wanted to 
create or thought there was promise um, because they were having trouble uh, engaging fathers in their, their um, families wanted to uh, try to replicate a program that was really successful in working with fathers. Um, so in her analysis, she found, if you'll go to the next slide, that in order to get to this fatherhood program, um, a family that lived in the northern part of the county actually had to travel outside of New Jersey into New York City, um, back into New Jersey, a two-and-a-half-hour bus ride um, at about $20 a person. So in order for that family to uh, access services, it was incredibly inconvenient. And we, you know, she, she said, what if you do this with two children? What if you do this if you're working or if you're attending school? Um, so the um, commissioner of the department was very taken by this map and asked this fellow to get her some data. So after the weeks after the final presentation, um, the fellow, along with her facilitator, began to compile data um, for the commissioner um, because the commissioner said, what if we could get a, a family success center that's not in Patterson that causes them to travel two and a half hours but closer to where they live? Um, so the result of that is on the next slide. Um, with the data that the fellow provided to the commissioner, um, a request for proposal was issued just five months after the final presentation and just... Uh, you know, a week and a half ago, these Family Success Center opened its doors. So um, the fellow in, in the front of this picture in the black and white shirt is the one who did this project, and she's there with all of her other fellows alumni celebrating the opening along with our commissioner. So this is really a success story for both um, the program, but for more importantly, the families of um, this community, because this program, you do not have to be involved with child welfare services in order to access this service. So this is something that anyone in the community can access um, that focuses on uh, building protective factors around families in a number of different ways. Next slide, please. Um, so this is uh, just the final case study of Bright Spots analysis and some real-time CQI, and this is how um, one of the expectations that we have the fellows to apply their skills immediately. Um, so this particular fellow who was in the most recent round oversees three investigative units. So during her monitoring of our case management system, she noticed that her unit's investigation timeliness numbers were not going in the direction she wanted. They, they actually got worse over a three-month period. Um, so once she learned um, some of the skills that she learned in fellows, she decided to um, dig a little deeper and do a little bit more analysis. Next slide, please. So just her three units um, brought her office in November down um, to the office in red um, to 66%. So she was able to see that there were offices doing better um, and there were offices that weren't doing um, quite so well. And um, she chose to apply one of the lessons learned from her seminar that um, people don't expect, people don't change when they hear what they're doing wrong. Um, and she used uh, a phrase, when the heart and the mind will follow. So she reminded the, the staff in her office to think about waiting for a doctor to call with test results, that we don't want to wait for doctors and our family shouldn't have to wait for, um, for us to make a decision on what's happening with their case, whether we're going to open it or close it or provide services. Um, so she was able to create concrete instructions, step-by-step -step guidance, and create a positive culture of peer pressure in her units that she supervised and actually identified people who were doing well as the bright spots in her office. She identified them publicly, and they did not like it because people in her office were used to hearing what they were doing wrong rather what they were doing right. Um, so after she celebrated the bright spots, next slide, please, they began to see measurable change. So they didn't wait until February to pat themselves on the back. When they had that jump in December, they began to celebrate. And then from there, um, they continued to celebrate. Next slide, please. So now not only is her uh, particular tier of three supervisors doing well, but her entire office, who again was at 66% in November, is excelling out of the other offices in their area and out outperforming the state aggregate as well. Next slide, please. 
Um, so some of the lessons that we've learned throughout the, uh, the course of fellows, uh, to begin to wrap this up, um, is that the coaching um, takes is more time consuming than we originally planned. Um, the fellows, as I spoke on before, um, we did have to build in an extra day for their assignments so they could manage their day-to-day -day work as well as their fellows' assignments. Um, one of the things that is a, a theme every year is that team and group work is new to many fellows. The applicants and the participants are usually the cream of the crop of the department. So they're used to being the go-to in their office. They're used to being the person who has the answers, who people seek out. So now they're in a room with 19 other people who are just like them, and the teamwork dynamic can become challenging. Um, so some of what we do is build um, uh, seminars and we build into seminars throughout the program um, things about how to work in team, how to coach your peers um, to get them through this team dynamic struggle. Um, we do set limits on how much data to provide because as they begin to build their skills, they want more and more, but we do have to stop them and, and continually refocus them. We also learn that sustainability takes time um, and that, you know, what we may think going into uh, going into one year, as we get into the year, um, things change a little bit, and we're still um, continually working to think of ways to sustain the program and to really, um, to, to really capitalize on the skills of all of the alumni in the local offices. Next slide, please. So to reiterate, the early leadership buy-in was incredibly essential to the success, um, the applied work, um, and the having fellows do hands-on work is critical, as well as individual co uh, coaching. Um, we are fortunate enough to be a department that um, is, is very used to and accepts using live data and accepts transparency in our data. Um, so that is invaluable and really adds intensity to the work that they do. Um, and we don't value quantitative over qualitative or vice versa. Um, it's all equally important and it's emphasized throughout the sessions. Um, so this idea of team competition has been a, a way um, to get the teams to want to do better than others, but also um, respect the work that the others are doing um, to, to get to the ultimate goal of, of having a good project and that benefits the department. Um, so next slide, please. Um, I won't read uh, point by point some of the overall impact, but as a whole, this fear and distrust of data is gone. Um, there is more of a focus on quality improvement at the ground level than there has been in years past, and I'm currently reviewing the applications for the next round, and each year the applications get stronger and stronger, and you can tell that, that data has, and uh, data-driven management and data-driven thinking has infused throughout the agency. Um, so the program is now embedded into the organization, and it's supported um, through all levels, but especially at the top. Um, and while the sharing of data um, can be a little bit scary at first, again, it creates this transparency and accountability that really um, lends to success. Um, so each class, the fellows leave with a greater appreciation of informed decision making um, and they talk about the decisions that they make when they come back that um, lead to better practice for the children and families that, that we serve. Um, next slide, please. So just quickly, this slide and the next slide um, are just examples of what a coaching session looks like. Uh, people are up, people are interacting, they um, use a variety of different um, uh, materials to share their learning and to get their learning. Um, and the next slide after this is the example of our um, auditorium where we have our presentation and of some of the poster session rooms and the way that they are, um, they are uh, presented. So uh, really this year was another successful event and we are looking forward to the next round of fellows. Um, next slide. So I did include um, references uh, with the invitation for the webinar. There was a link to um, an article in Governing Magazine um, talking a little bit about the Fellows Program, but our full evaluation of the first round is available um, by Action Research Partners at the bottom. And um, 
the IBM Center for the Business of Government also uh, recently published a report about our Managed by Data program if you'd like more information. Um, and that is all that I have. So I thank you very much for your time, and I'll turn it back over to Joyce and her crew. Well, Abby, I want to extend a huge thank you to you. Um, what a fascinating program, and I suspect we're going to have a few questions from our attendees. So um, may we please open the phone lines or the chat feature to our attendees for the question and answer session. And Christy, I think you're going to manage this. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. So the operator will unmute the audience, and I will also read off the chat questions. Thank you. At this time, we will begin the question and answer session of the conference. To ask a question by the phones, please press star 1 and record your name clearly for question introduction. Again, star one and clearly record your name for question introduction. One moment, please, to see if we have questions from the phone. While we're, while we're waiting to see if any questions are submitted by phone, um, let me kick off uh, with a question, please. Um, there obviously is a huge investment in time, but also in dollars. Um, Abby and Amanda, might you have some budget, budget metrics um, for the fellows program? Uh, we don't have that prepared for today. OK. Certainly um, uh, get something together and share it with you. Yeah, if, if any state would like information relating to that particular issue, uh, if you could just email me at Joyce at K Assets and I'll get it on to Abby and Amanda. So um, I don't know if there's any questions by phone, but perhaps, Christy, you could read some of the chat questions. Sure. Um, the next one we have is if you did not have the performance measures related to your oversight, would it have been hard to decide on an initial data measure that you have started with? Would you have been up? Would it have been up to your staff or from outside an outside consultant? So this is Amanda. Um, you know, I think um, you know outside certainly of our safe measures performance management system. You know, we're all using AFGARS and NCANS data as well. Right, that all states are required to be, you know, publishing. And so I think at the very least, right, you can be looking at, you know, the co cohorts of children that are either coming in through um, the NCANS files in terms of abuse and neglect data or around um, some of the outcome data for kids in foster care through AFGARS, right? So that could be a potential source of information. I think, um, you know, certainly I think having the data accessible is a huge part of this. Um, and I think Safe Measures has been an invaluable tool for us to really springboard some of our learning, especially at the local level, because that's information that's really available um, to every worker in our system. And most, most of the staff, so again, about, you know, 70 to 75 percent of participants start in uh, the child protection permanency arm of the department. So most of them, they do not think about the AFCARs and NCANS data. They do not think about the, the larger reporting that we do. So their day-to-day -day is in safe measures, but in fellows, we teach them a, and to utilize safe measures better, but most of the data we have is pulled from our you know, more standard reporting that we do um, outside of the creating a cohort specifically around the topic. I think another piece um, that Abby kind of touched on briefly is um, the case record review that is also part of the fellows program, right? So in terms of developing a survey, learning how to read a case record and abstracting information of a statistically significant representative sample of the population, right? That's another way to collect some um, different pieces of information that may not be available through um, through the AFCARS and NCANS data or through other sources of um, quantitative data that's aggregated, 
but really able to abstract from the chart or the record, um, you know, whatever information is collected by the worker. Great, thank you. Our next question is, was an outside group help, helped with the designing of your program? Yes, yes. There was um, a, a group here in New Jersey um, where they had experience working with us in the, with the department in the past. Um, they were, we contracted with them to create the curriculum and to do some of that work after getting the grant from NCIC back in 2009. And they were involved with the program through uh, the most recent round. Um, and we strategically, um, throughout the years, reduced their involvement and increased the capacity of the, the alumni. I was a member of the first class of fellows um, when I was sitting in a local office and have been involved with the program every year. Um, and eventually I became the secession plan to bring the, the program into the department. Um, so I sit now in the coordinator role, um, and last year we teamed with the consultant to um, to really transfer all of the, their learning over to me to be able to fully run the program internally. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is, are you seeing a consistent level of interest in people wanting to become a fellow or an increase in applicants? And do you select on a first-come, first-served basis, or are you trying a wider geographic representation? That is a great question, because I am in the middle of reviewing applications at the moment. Um, yes, we, um, the, so again, the first year there were 147 applicants for 100 spots. Um, and as we shifted the program with 40 spots, um, the application date deadline closes tomorrow at close of business. Um, and already I have about 65, 70 applications, and usually there's a rush at the end. Um, last year, there were more than double the applications for spots available. So as people, you know, when they first read about the program, people did not know what to expect, did not know whether the commitment would be worth it. Um, so for the frontline staff, that are some that are genuinely lifelong learners and just want to absorb as much as they can from the department. Um, there are some that see the promotability because so many of the participants have been promoted into various roles or, like I said, assume different um, responsibilities once uh, they graduated or even during the program. So there's kind of a twofold, but there's absolutely um, continued interest. And um, every last summer when we were looking at applications, and again this summer I have frontline workers and investigators, clerical staff, our case aides, um, lots of different people at, in the, the organization want to uh, participate in the program. And the quality of applicants, um, I think, reflects the shift that the department has made because um, reviewing applications over the past few years, um, this particular crop of applications, people are using charts and data and talking about different reports. Um, in, in ways that they use data on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I see that reflected um, anecdotally uh, in the applications. And the selection process, um, we developed a rubric. Um, it is not done geographically um, because uh, we have a very strong uh, public union here. Um, so there are some considerations to be made when um, there are different offices that use fellows as something for promotions. We cannot limit, um, because we may need a fellow in a certain area, um, that person shouldn't have uh, more of an opportunity than someone sitting elsewhere. So the application process is based on um, a little bit on some of their past CQI work, um, but we ask them to talk about a project that, that they've um, that they've gone through, um, ways that they've used data to improve outcomes, and we ask them for as many specific examples as possible. So it's really um, heavily weighted towards the kinds of work they've done, they've done and the interest that they show in fellows and how they plan to use um, the knowledge that they learn in fellows um, once they graduate and during the program. Thank you. Um, the next chat question is, is are there any other states with similar programs? Um, so I have talked to several other states that um, I think 
So the, uh, the group that we've worked with does work in other states at different levels, uh, maybe not a project this big. Um, so there are a couple of counties in Pennsylvania that are doing a similar model. Um, they're, they're, I've talked to people from uh, Tennessee, from New York. I've talked to people from different states. Um, and certainly at our presentations, uh, we have opened up for other states that are interested in seeing what it's all about and seeing what a presentation looks like and the kinds of things that um, – you know, staff are doing, uh, we have had other states come to, to watch the presentations. And certainly, if anyone listening would be interested in doing that, you can contact uh, me and Amanda, and, and we can talk about that as we get closer in February and then again in June. All right. And at this time, there are another chat questions. Are there any questions by telephone? At this time, I show no questions from the phones. Okay. Um, uh, I am wondering if perhaps you could share the uh, ac actual fellows application that we could post to our uh, website along with this uh, webinar. Is that possible? Sure. Okay, if you would uh, email that to me, I would appreciate it, Abby. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, any more chat questions? We have a few minutes left. Time for some more questions, if there are any. Christy? Uh, just an appreciation of great uh, webinar. Thank you very much. So let's, um, again, um, thank you, Abby and Amanda. Um, um, like I said, to me, this was absolutely fascinating. So uh, huge thank you. Um, yes. let's, move yeah. then to, let's move then to our conclusion. If you would chain, advance the slide, Christy, I would appreciate it. So we, again, hope that the information shared with you today was both um, very informative and valuable in your um, everyday work life. Uh, as a reminder, please remember to register for the August webinar once the announcement is released. Additionally, if you have any additional questions regarding today's topic, would like more information about any of our scheduled webinars, or would like to volunteer your state as a topic presenter, please do not hesitate to contact me at uh, Joyce at KFS.com. So once again, this webinar has been recorded and will be made available online. When it is complete and posted, we will send a message via the SACWIS Manager's Listserv with the link. So uh, thank you for attending. Goodbye. This concludes today's conference. All participants may disconnect at this time. Thank you.